Good. Are ready to go now? Yep. Okay. So, Ani, bonjour, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the final uh, speaker that we have as part of Indigenous History Month, where I'm just so thrilled that I managed to control uh, Alan Corbier to, to doing this. Um, and, uh, and just for your, your interest in this, this whole series um, and this final talk. So part of um, our efforts for Indigenous uh, History Month, which is, was June, was just to um, have a series of, of talks and speakers and a number of events uh, in Indigenous history through the Indigenous Environmental uh, Justice Project uh, website and social media so that people could just learn more about, uh, more about um, actually not even just about Indigenous people, but actually really making an effort to learn from Indigenous people from their point of view and from their understanding, which I, I think um, this talk today was really going to, I think is really going to hopefully um, cement a lot of that because Alan will be speaking about uh, place, language and story and how Anishinaabe people view history, which is, um, which is might be different than how other people might think about um, how everybody else, under, everyone else understands Anishinaabe history, but really from our own point of view. Um, so I'm just, uh, I'm just thrilled that he's here to be able to do that. So that's just probably a simpler way of saying uh, a, a title that we that we uh, shot around initially, Sources of Anishinaabe History, Narratives, Archives, and Museum Collections, which sounds really complicated. Place and knowledge and story sounds, um, sounds like something that we'll really uh, super, uh, super enjoy today. So we're just, um, what we'd like to do is, um, you could, we're happy to field questions. Alan will be happy to field uh, questions. And if some of them are relevant throughout his talk, we'll, we'll try to uh, see if they could get addressed there. But if not, we'll try to leave time at, at the end for people um, to be able to engage with Alan and, um, and ask some questions. But uh, Alan will introduce himself further, but Alan is, uh, Dr. Corbier, uh, is a, a recent hire at York University in the Department of History in Indigenous History. Um, Paul Goldswell will be a Canada Research Chair in Indigenous History, so that's all really, uh, really exciting. Um, has been super committed and passionate about um, Anishinaabe win um, and the centrality of that in the research that he does um, and worked in uh, Chiging in language revitalization efforts and served also as director for the Ojibwe Culture Foundation. Uh, recently won an award, I guess, actually maybe it wasn't so, uh, so recent, the Governor General of Canada's Victoria Service Medal for uh, for the language work that he's done. So um, so many of us are just really appreciative of the, the kind of effort and, and passion that Alan uh, that Alan has shown for that. So he's the the final speaker. So we got in for June thirtieth, the last day of uh, Indigenous History Month. So again, just welcome and enjoy. Um, beautiful day to enjoy it, at least anywhere, like in the GTA, uh, maybe it's too hot outside to run around and do stuff. So maybe this is the perfect time to hear a talk on, on history. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, um, to Alan and uh, enjoy. I know I'm going to. Okay, miigwech Deb. Ninso jik binendo dem mampim chiging don jaba. Minwa ojibwe. Bode Ademi Ndao. I am a Nishnabe of Ojibwe and Potawatomi uh, descent. And my name is Ojik in Ojibwe, and that means the fisher. And my Dodem, my clan, is what we call the rough grouse, but others say uh, the um, partridge. Um, Chiging is on Manitoulin Island and this is in Ontario. I don't know where everyone is tuning in from. So I just wanted to say Nanabojo Nishnabe Dok, which can dok minwage kinen den wen magne dok. I greet you in the name of Nanabojo, all of my relations, fellow Nishnabe, as well as friends. I was asked to talk about uh, well Deb and I just talked back and forth a bit about what what we actually would talk about in June as Aboriginal or Indigenous History Month. So we, we never really settled down on the actual title per se. And it was initially uh, look, gonna look at sources, uh, being museums, oral history, language, and uh, archives. 
but uh, as I started thinking more and more about it, it was uh, Deb kept stressing that uh, it was kind of whatever I wanted to talk about and what I thought people might want to hear. But I, I actually like to uh, put some of these ideas out there and hopefully get kind of some feedback as I'm writing. Uh, I'm supposed to be writing a book and uh, I should say mm -hmm. I, I am writing a book and I have been hired at York University uh, January 2020. So I'll start teaching in September 2020, but I'll be uh, uh, doing so online. So I, I've got to uh, revise the course syllabus, but I also have to write this book. So I've been uh, kicking around ideas for a while and I've been doing a lot of reading. Anyway, when I applied for this uh, Canada Research Chair, one of the first statements I made was that uh, Indigenous history is still principally drawn from the colonial record, that is the archives, what is written by Indian agents, priests, fur and fur traders and soldiers. Those are the principal means still how we actually engage in a Indigenous history. The elders that I had talked to throughout the years and then also in different books uh, that I've read of elders accounts of history usually stress that they are still, our history is still not being told properly or even uh, in the best medium that it was handed down, meaning the original indigenous language. So in my case, it's uh, Anishinaabemowin or some say Ojibwemowin or Odawamowin. And even if you wanted to get more technical, uh, Bodwe Adamowi Moen. So there's uh, different languages that we use to, to tell our story, but of course, uh, a lot of the archival sources that have been uh, uh, that are accessed, it's usually the majority that we use now is uh, English, and that's because we've all been, well, the majority of us have been educated in English. But there is also a tremendous amount in the in written in French that, as a non-speaker of French, and I, I sometimes can read and write some some parts of French, but not enough to actually analyze the, those archival documents. I um, I think that we we still have to access a lot of French documents, but even more precious to me are documents written in Ojibwe. And in the archival research that I have done, I have found a number of different letters written by, by chiefs in the mid 19th century. That was when there was a, a kind of a, a boom of uh, our, our chiefs and our ancestors, our grandfathers used to write in Ojibwe and people don't really seem to know that or recognize that, but now that's starting to come out a bit more uh, at this at this time. And we, uh, I've put together a number of these uh, documents as much as I can that are written by our chiefs. Some of them are written to to the. Uh, Minister of Indian Affairs, sometimes just to the local su uh, superintendent or Indian agent. And then other times they are written to the, the uh, governor general, as well as even the, some even wrote to the Pope, but also to bishops. And then uh, so I put these letters together and some were come from around Manitoulin Island, but others from other areas. And as I collect these more, there are some that are written in different orthographies, uh, especially what I would call a, uh, the uh, Methodist or Anglican orthography that was uh, uh, kind of perpetuated and set down by the Reverend Peter Jones, who was a Methodist missionary. And then those that followed him followed, followed that orthography. And then the French orthography that uh, the Jesuits used that were ended up 
being uh, used up here. But that's still, you could literally just count how many of those letters so far that I have found. And there's no more than a hundred that I found so far. So finding our Anishinaabe perspective written by our chiefs at the time of those treaties or at the time of historical events that we want to actually learn about is very scant. There's a very scant record from our point of view written by our chiefs. Uh, so what we ha have had to rely on as well is uh, uh, anthropologists, ethnographers, and others that have actually recorded our elders when they have told those stories in Ojibwe and those stories that have been handed down. So those stories that have been handed down, they, they appear in uh, a variety of collections. And uh, linguists that I liked reading their work, the work of uh, various linguists, like uh, John Nichols, who is, was situated at the University of Manitoba for a while in the University of Minnesota. And then of course, uh, the work of uh, Anton Troyer with his uh, Oshkabewis native journal. And then uh, a, a linguist, uh, Rand Valentine as well. So there's a lot of different uh, recordings that are um, becoming more accessible uh, in this uh, modern age now, especially with uh, archives, uh, different archives and different repositories are putting up those collections and making them more accessible uh, digitally. Whereas before uh, 10 years ago, you had to actually go to that archive to actually listen to these recordings that are either done on wax recordings or or other uh, obsolete uh, devices. So now we've had a bit of a, a, a resurgence of a, of a uh, anything written in, in our language. And now as we get more sources from our elders and from elders that are past, we're actually able to start looking at those stories and try to match them with what the, uh, the Indian agents, the priests, and the uh, uh, fur traders had written about us. So then we get a different uh, perspective of actually our, hopefully what we would say is our perspective, because of course, as you know, there isn't one, only one perspective in history. But what, uh, what we're able to do now is look at these stories and uh, put them together and match them or try to match them with uh, the written record as well as now uh, what others are also doing, of course, is archeological records and, and museum collections as well. So it's, a, it's an exciting time for, to me for, to be in history because you can try and pull all these disparate sources together and try and create a more fuller record of history of what, what, what occurred in the past in order to, uh, to understand our current situation and then to further improve it for the future generations. So that's what we, what the elders used to always, uh, well, what the elders always say. You will keep in mind those that are yet to come. You will honor those ones that have passed on, our, meaning our ancestors. So we, we, Try when we're living in, in this time that we have here on earth, we, we honor our ancestors, but we also keep in mind those ones that are yet to come. So as uh, many of you know, our languages are, are, uh, aren't being as spoken as much as they used to. And we're try people are trying different things, immersion schools for uh, kindergartens and uh, elementary schools, and then others are trying immersion schools with uh, adults and there's a, a fantastic a couple of fantastic programs actually now uh, they're they're doing a really good job and then the, the one out in uh, in Minnesota with uh, Luciana Bonaccio as well as uh, Brendan Fairbanks and they, at the University of Minnesota they're just doing a lot of good work that I see a lot of young people picking up the language so it's a more heartening time now to, to actually undertake this kind of analysis and undertake this kind of research and to try and put together our story and get that into, into the, not only provincial curriculum or state curriculum, but also on reserve on our, in our curriculum. Uh, 
Uh, and that's basically where I've been, what I've been trying to do for the last number of years, but it's, uh, it's kind of a, uh, been a bottleneck in a sense of uh, typing out all these variant orthographies into the current double vowel orthography and then double checking that with uh, different elders or speakers, namely my, usually my dad. And then also one of my mentors, uh, Marianne Corbier, Dr. Marianne Corbier from uh, University of Sudbury. So I, I try to pull together a lot of this stuff and, and then it's, uh, it's a bit tedious in some senses, but uh, one of the things that I, I, one of the books that I really enjoyed and use, and I'll, I'll talk about this, is a book uh, that was uh, edited by Howard Webb Kamagat of uh, Wequemcom. And it's called uh, Odawa Stories from the Springs. And uh, it, it's a bilingual book, but it's stories from Harbor Springs, Michigan. And he, he listened to those old recordings that are held at the American Philosophical Society in, uh, in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So he, he, just the sheer amount of work of listening to all those tapes, writing them out in the current orthography and then double checking the translations is just a huge undertaking. And I, I always try to uh, get people to purchase that book and to, to use that book as, as a way to look at, look at our, our history. So one of the things early on when I was doing my undergrad, uh, this was in the late 80s and early 90s uh, was when I read uh, the Mishoma's book by Eddie Benton Benet. And one of the lines in that book that always kind of guided my research is that when he talks about Oshkib Madzajik, new people will appear. And new people will appear and they will look for things left along the trail. And of course, left, looking for things left along the trail to me meant looking for muse items that are currently in museums, but also recordings that are in archives, writings that are in different archives, as well as songs and ceremonies that uh, people still carry in their living uh, memory. So, and then to pull these all together. So that was, that's been one of my kind of uh, guiding guiding goals throughout this, uh, throughout my education, is that finding things left along the trail. And then another elder from our area, the late Dan Pine said, uh, you know, it's, it's time to wake up the medicines. And of course for Anishinaabe people, medicine isn't just uh, over-the-counter pharmaceuticals. It isn't just salves and ointments and, uh, and kwakadon sanna or pills. It's actually, those songs, those stories, those teachings, uh, some, sometimes uh, called intangible. So that's what I, I've been trying to, to learn about and to share whenever I come across something, I try to, try to share it. So one of, the, one of the other, coming up, trying to analyze history, our history from our point of view, I read an article quite a while ago that was written by uh, Onabanese, otherwise known as uh, Jim Dumont. And in this article, it was called Journey to Daylight Land through Ojibwe Eyes. And the, the quote that I'm gonna read here is the one that I, I used as, as a kind of a pillar of, my, of the framework of when I try to do Anishinaabe history. So he says, quote, it is necessary to look at the North American native legend and mythology with an appropriate kind of vision. The kind of vision we are talking about is indeed a total way of seeing, which encompasses the essential elements of ordinary reality and seeks out the all important manifestations of non-ordinary reality. This way of seeing recognizes two different realities, which though separated by a seemingly tremendous gulf, are concurrent and simultaneous, as well as impinging upon one another constantly, end quote. So he wrote that in 1976, and the examples that he used when he was, uh, the, the stories that he used 
was a story that we, in Chiging, uh, talk about an ancestor of the Debaske family, and his name was Nibakum. And Nibakum fought during the War of 1812, and he had his young men uh, scout out the American position and to gauge how many guns they had, as well as their numbers, as well as their formation. And in the story, it is said that those young men were able to change themselves into bats at night and to go and do, uh, do their reconnaissance. So what Jim Dumont says is that is the part of native history. And he says, but a mainstream histor historian would have trouble actually uh, incorporating that part into their story. They, they would see that as too, as fantastic or out of the ordinary and that they don't really necessarily believe in this metamorphosis. So the, a mainstream historian would tend to make that into a metaphor or, or a simile. And uh, Jim Dumont says that a mainstream historian might say, they cloak themselves under cover of the night, making themselves as in, inconspicuous as bats in order to conduct their reconnaissance. And he says, this would be a disservice to Anishinaabe history. So for Anishinaabe history, basically, it is what he calls non-ordinary reality that we actually believe forms a basic part of our history. And that's the part that really doesn't get serious uh, um, consideration in, in, in the indigenous history as it's taught today. The other book I read a while ago when I was in my undergrad, and this also still forms a part of my my framework is I read uh, God has read a native view of religion by Vine Deloria Jr. Of course, it's a, a classic, uh, but he covers uh, history in there as well. And one of the things that he had said is uh, quote, in theory, it is entirely possible to construct the chronological history of a tribe. This task would be accomplished by knowing the sacred places within the tribe's geography and all of the stories that are related to these places by identifying the before and after of the stories and then arranging them on a time scale, one could project a chronology, end quote. So the, what he's reacting to or what he's commenting on there is this notion again that I had mentioned earlier that some of the elders that I, that I used to listen to that I had the privilege of listening to who have since gone on these elders used to say that the, the land is our history book, or some would even say the land is our Bible. So this is what Vine Deloria is talking about, is that uh, indigenous history is done uh, and is encoded in place names on, on the earth. And that if we know those place names, we know those stories that go with them, know those songs, then we can actually, we, we, we'll know uh, indigenous history from our point of view. So what he was also critiquing was uh, uh, Western, Western uh, historians propensity for chronology and that uh, native people, indigenous people don't necessarily ascribe to that chronological timescale. Their timescale is more cyclical and uh, circular. So these are two main precepts or challenges that uh, indigenous historians face today and how they are gonna try and incorporate that in, while they do what is called uh, history now, uh, mainstream history. So you got all these different uh, uh, sub-disciplines of history uh, right now going on, uh, public history, uh, queer history, uh, all these different types of history that you, you can focus on. Uh, but one of the things is uh, of course indigenous history and when we tackle a term like indigenous history, we're kind of in a sense saying that indigenous history, there's all, there, many of these indigenous groups are all the same. So I, I try to avoid that. And I try to say that I'm, I'm trying to do an Anishinaabe history. But I'm, as you see, I'm, I'm quoting from Vine Deloria Jr. who is a, who is a Sioux. But there are precepts that uh, kind of span the, the, the area uh, and, and the different nations. So one of the things that uh, has received a lot of attention is that the Anishinaabe people call their stories Adazokan, 
or Anso Khan in our dialect, and uh, the Bajmawin. And Anso Khan is what people usually have translated as myth or legend. And, uh, and then, but now it is also uh, translated as the characters in those myths or legends. And meanwhile, uh, the Bajamawin is actually a narration, a report, or a story. And uh, the late uh, great Nishnabe teacher, Basil Johnson, in his uh, beginner course outline for uh, Ojibwe beginner course outline done in 1978, he, he breaks down this word, uh, the Bajma, as uh, being the Ba, meaning measure. So when we say the Ba again, or uh, the Baganatik, that's a ruler. So the Ba is a measure, and then Ajma is uh, giving an account. So the Bajma wind is giving a measured account, and a measured account of what had occurred. So anyway, uh, and the Adzokan. So people, scholars now are writing about this Adzokan, Adzokan versus uh, the Bajma wind. And what I kind of see happening that I don't really agree with is sometimes they, they create this, maybe unwittingly, this dichotomy that either a story is an Ansokan or it's a Dabajamoan. But actually when you listen to these stories and you listen to the storytellers tell them, it's actually not so clear cut. There is no dichotomy per se. There is a, there is a spectrum and, and some are definitely, okay, that's an Ansokan and that's a Dabajamoan. But other times, the, the, the lines are really blurred in between. One of the stories on Manitoulin Island is about uh, Jishiguaning, and that's a, a, a reserve on Manitoulin Island at the West End. And uh, we had, at the, when I worked at the Ojibwe Culture Foundation, we had a, a recording of, by uh, Mary Grace Pelche, who is from Wikwam Kong, and she told the story of this. So at the begin, very beginning of the recording, she, she's asked uh, about, about it and then uh, about just stories of Manitoulin. And here she says, Niing, Jishi Guaning, Jishi Guaning Nongo and Jishin Kadek. Anso Kan Go We. So she says, she, Why Shishi Guaning is called Shishi Guaning today? This is a legend, Anso Kan Go We. Then she says, right after that, Gi Jueb Dagabash Go Ge Go. It did happen. Kaego at Ansokan Auzano. It is not only a legend. Gunon dam nako Ansokadek with Jishiguaning. Did you ever hear the legend of Jishiguaning? So, why that's so intriguing to me is that she uses, she says it's a legend, but then she says it's not really a legend. It really did happen. So, to me, the, the storytellers often vouch for that. So when I was doing uh, archival research, I came across what they call the Bell, what is called the Bell Papers. And Robert Bell uh, worked for the uh, Ca Canadian Geological Survey, but he got interested in uh, uh, indigenous stories and he got people to write them down or he went and visited them and wrote them down. And when he wrote them down, then he has this collection of uh, these stories. But one that he, one, he paid this fella named uh, Eskimo to, to uh, tell these stories. And when he wrote them, he said, mail them and I'll pay you when I receive them. So Eskimo then recorded his, uh, his, uh, uncle, his relative, George Eskimo. And in 1892, George Eskimo told that same story of the founding of uh, Jishiguaning. And then he, similarly, he stated right off the top that this did happen, but more than two generations ago. So again, People will call that uh, a, a legend. And basically the, the long and short of that story is that uh, a young woman is fasting and then the people are actually at that time experiencing a famine and they're going hungry. But then uh, the, the fishermen, fishers of that uh, village end up catching a sturgeon. And the sturgeon has a different marking and it looks different. Something's not quite right with it, but they're all hungry so they eat it. And then as they, as they eat it, they, the number, they, they turn, start to turn into snakes. So, of course, people of Jishiguan don't like this story anymore. 
but anyway, um, the that's the story that Mary Grace Pelche told, and that's the story that George Eskima wrote down. There's more to the whole story, of course. I'm just giving you the Coles Notes for, version of it. But this again, this comes to the principle or the crux of the difference between the indigenous history and mainstream history. Main, uh, indigenous history, the, the elders and the people that told the story actually say that this happened. And one person actually said what happened more than two, two generations ago. And so, uh, whereas to believe that actual people turned metamorphosed and turned into snakes uh, kind of uh, challenges our belief system today. So that was uh, from a collection that we had put together by the, uh, at the Ojibwe Culture Foundation. And those uh, stories have been published in a book called uh, Getsa Pichijik the Bajmawak. And uh, if, you, if you ever get a chance to check out, uh, want to check out some books, uh, some stories in, written in Ojibwe and in English, translated into English, that's one of them at the Ojibwe Culture Foundation. So the other, again, that's non-ordinary reality that what Jim Dumont has called non-ordinary reality. And then again, this is also looking at that particular story that also gets to what uh, Vine Deloria Jr. was talking about, gathering the stories attached to place and trying then to put them all together to come up with a, either a chronology or a grand narrative of Anishinaabe history that spans this whole, whole land, Mikanak, Minishing, or some say Mishike, Minisink, this Turtle Island, not just Nido Minisink, this Manitoulin Island. Anyway, so there's a, a lot of different sources out there now that are coming out, being published, but uh, I think in time we're going to actually be able to incorporate a bit more and uh, actually get back to telling our, our history in our language. And that's what these stories are, are setting the foundation to do. So the next story that I want to uh, discuss is uh, taken from the Howard, Howard Webb Kamagat's uh, anthology, Odawa Stories from the Springs. This story, he, he entitled it, The Man Who Was Taken Away by the Great Eagle. And this great eagle uh, takes this guy out who, this guy is out ice fishing and he's got his uh, his uh, eshkan, eshkanak, and that's uh, to chip the ice. Anyway, as he's out there, that eagle just comes, the giant eagle just comes and picks him up and takes him away. And as he's taking him away, he flies up to his uh, his eerie, this uh, this giant bird, and he. He tries to, as he goes flying up, he flies and he lets go of that Nishnabe and he tries to smash him against the, against the cliff face. But he uses that uh, Eshkanak, that uh, chisel, to stop himself from being smashed. So that eagle tries to kill him a number of different ways because he actually wants to feed him to his young. Anyway, he survives. So he finally, that, that uh, Binesse, they say, that giant bird, puts that, uh, that Nishnabe in his nest. So here's part of the story that uh, is transcribed by Howard Webb Kamagat. Oh, it's so beautiful and peaceful up there. Up on this, high on this great cliff. The cliff was similar to the way cliffs look down here on earth. And that is how they were up there. Me go ejina god nik ode shpiming. The big guna idik. Gaegi kenzin. The man did not know where he was. And while he was there, he would sleep when he felt safe. Me dash guding go naash yat je. Mba sa gienko. Anish dom kumuan ge go wi bwa to dagot. He would fall asleep when he felt safe as he was watching out for himself so that the great birds would not harm him in any way. So again, I want to just emphasize there that this giant bird takes this Nishnabe from here and he says he took him up way up high and that place looked the same as it does down here. And remember Jim Dumont's uh, article that the places 
are concurrent and simultaneous and uh, in a sense parallel. So the story, story continues. The, the Nishnabe isn't killed by this giant bird, but he's actually uh, in the nest with the, with the uh, baby birds. And he ends up starting to feed those baby birds because the giant, the mother bird brings in the, his prey, but he starts cutting it up and feeding those birds and those birds are able to eat. This great eagle swooped downward and after a length of time, the man noticed something off in the distance as they were flying along. There was something that looked like a hole to this man as he looked around and it was the earth he saw off and in the distance, a small dot. Then as the great bird had swooped down far enough, he started to fly and he flew to the place where he originally got the man. That is where the great bird flew. The great eagle placed the man at the very spot he had taken him from. It is not known at what time of day it was when this man was returned to earth. This man was away for a long, long time when he was up there helping the hatchlings to eat. This great bird took the man to the exact spot he had gotten him from. And again, the great eagle crouched down so the man could get off his back safely. So again, he takes him right to that spot where he had taken him. And when he, when he had taken him, he had taken him from that different spot, put him right back to that spot. So this book, I, I, just, I see I've been asked to repeat the name of this, uh, this story. It's called, uh, it's by Howard Webb Kamagat, and it's called Odawa Stories from the Springs. Odawa, O-T-T-A-W-A, -T -T -A -A, Odawa Stories from the Springs. And it's uh, published by University of Michigan Press. So the the other part, the next part that uh, I wanted to to focus on is uh, the next part of the story. Anish misagi majat maba nishnabe ga binjabat guna gi ja anin de gie guna gaje mamka den de manet ote ne. Well, this man then went back home. Oh, the people of his community were awestruck or probably dumbfounded by his arrival as he had been gone for such a long time. This man, he still looked the same and he did not have any fish with him. This man had supposedly gone ice fishing. So when he arrived at his home, he told what he had ha what had happened. He told the people everything that had happened to him. He told them about how the great eagle tried to kill him by smashing him into the face of this great cliff. So again, he gets placed right back where he was taken, but it, all the people are surprised to see him uh, at that time. And they say, they tell him that he was gone a very long time. But to that man in the story, 
he was actually just gone a few days. Again, now going back to that same article that Jim Dumont had, uh, had written uh, in 76, du uh, Jim Dumont talks about other stories where the Anishinaabe explained that one day in the spirit world is one year here on earth. So even though the event is concurrent and simultaneous, there is a difference in the rate of time passing between these two realms, even though they're happening at the same time, just the rate of time, rate of the passage of time is different. For the spirit, one day here, uh, I mean, one day in the spirit world is one year here. So that man was gone a long time, but he he just felt like he was gone for a couple of days. And he, this is a common theme in our in our Nishnabe stories. There is a, a collection of uh, the by William Jones collected in around 1910, 1912. Uh, he was half a uh, fox, a fox Indian, Meskwaki, and, uh, and he went up to Thunder Bay, uh, Boy Fort and other areas. And he mm -hmm. had uh, collected uh, stories told in Ojibwe and he painstakingly wrote them down. But one of them that I really like is similar to this story. And it's a common motif, as I mentioned, is that uh, one, one young boy was taken by Mishinamegwe, the, the giant sturgeon. One day this boy is sitting out by the, by the beach and then he goes uh, swimming, but then he, he's kind of taken away by that uh, sturgeon. Anyway, he hops on that sturgeon, uh, that sturgeon changes him into a sturgeon and the two of them go exploring all of Lake Superior. Meanwhile, his parents are worried sick and they keep coming back and they come back year after year to that same spot to wait for this boy and hoping that he comes back. And then four years or 10 years down the road, here that boy is sitting there on a rock on the shore. And uh, he's the same age as he was. And uh, his parents are, yeah, it was 10 years because his parents look old. So anyway, this is a common motif in our, in our stories of this passage of time in the spirit world where the, whoever gets taken, actually seems like they, they've just gone, been gone a couple of days. But uh, as they come back, it's been a long time that they've actually been absent. So that's the other thing with dealing with our history. The other thing about that is that this is where Mio de Gindak Kenjiget Anishinaabe. The Anishinaabe goes seeking knowledge over there. And oftentimes, this is where the Anishinaabe finds knowledge or medicine when he is uh, absconded or when he was taken by a spirit. And the spirit then blesses him, him or her, and uh, gives them medicine to help, help the people. So they often come back from these uh, sword horns and they, they've been outfitted with some kind of medicine, some kind of teaching or ceremony. Same with this fella who was taken by the giant eagle. Then this great eagle arose and he flew away. This man had been given careful instructions on what he was supposed to do. So that is what this man did. This is what the eagle told the man. And those names, never ever forget these names which I am giving to you. These are the names which you will be known by. So that that man that was taken by the eagle, he is given that these names to carry and to give to, to people that need names. So this is where the practice of the naming ceremony comes from that the Odawa still do today, the giving of the names. P. Dapnamuat, Ionei Sa Nozwen, 
Kinagogi Windamal get go. But must say, ah, on the way to go, Kinago Nibana knows when that. All these names, and they also chant and sing for those names. He was told by the great eagle everything they are supposed to do when they are having a naming ceremony. Kaegona Gikenzin, Kchenibana Mingon knows when that. Midash Gunda Nishnabek, Nongo knows Wajin, Newe Wawin Dasawat. So, anyway, this is what happened to this man I'm talking about. This man was taken far away by this great eagle, way up high someplace, where there are these great cliffs. And then he ends with the formulaic saying, This is the end of the story about this man that I was talking about. So, again, these, these stories are to actually explain as well some of our customs and practices and traditions and how they came into being and why we do what we're doing, but also that these names are actually to be perpetuated as they are a part of our, our history as well. A second story that I want to talk about from that same book by Howard Webb Kamagat, uh, Odawa Stories from the Springs. This one is called, he called it, the story of an Anishinaabe girl who was taken away. And in this story, this, this girl is lured away by a handsome man. And this young lady sees this handsome man and she, she's attracted to him and she ends up uh, going with him. And then they, they end up going into the water and she she finds it strange that she's able to go into the water and then actually keep walking under the water and then when she gets under the water and gets to his house she finds a, a house there underwater and she she meets his parents and then this young man is scolded by his parents he said the the old man says to, to his son why did you bring her here don't you know that the Nishnabe, Nishnabe Nidowe, he says, the Nishnabe has a, is a spirit and the Nishnabe has spiritual power. Tam Nidokewa Nishnabe, Gi Gonoa. This one, this old man says to his son, they're going to do a ceremony and they're going to try and find her and they won't stop until they find her. Please take her back. But he also, of course, why he took her, he fell in love with her. Anyway, there's a search party. Everyone's out looking for her. And uh, the, the village is looking for her. And they, sure enough, they do a ceremony. Anyway, here's, uh, this is the, I'm reading from the story. Ya mabuksha naina win ayat bekit one gian. Oh my goodness, she's right here. That is what that person said as he approached her. Mabasa niani nawe. Here she is. At the Gien go be the but what is the one or the Nendane Gujin. Up to go Kche Ndane Gaza, Batinok Nendana Wajik. There were many people who ran toward her. These were the ones who had been searching out searching for her. All these people were out looking for her. This was a massive search party. Misa Gien Gim Kowin Maba Kwezes. And so this girl was now found. On the peach Benjabayan in Where did you come from? She was asked by the people. Kachin Nibna Ching Janda Nibmuseme Dane Goyin. We have walked by here this very spot many times searching for you. Meanwhile, go Gunda Ginagie Nin Maba. And then they took her home. And then the, the, the storyteller then interjects and uh, kind of has a sidebar here. He says, the storyteller says, Mi o de ning, ja wigening, man da gin jejewebat, ge get the go man da gi jewebat, gi gamoding, wa quesens. Remember, this happened at the place called ja wigening. This really happened a long, to long time ago that this girl was kidnapped and then taken someplace. Yak dash ge nam bing nidoki yajik. Me ge gal gimo ditwa 
Shkinue, Nue Yaoan, Gigan Nagon. It was the spirits who live under the water. That was who, who came and took the girl away for a little while. Mi Sagien O de the Bagum Bagumwa Didwat Ge Gim Kwawat Nue Ge get Sagien Go na Mi Gien Go O de Gi Be Madwe Mizit Tagazawat Ge Yawak and Im Kik O de Epin Gishmakko Be Mizit Tagazajik. So anyway, the people arrived at their town with the girl they finally found. And at that moment, the thunder could be heard coming from the west. So here, again, to elaborate upon or to reinforce what both Vindaloria had said and Onabanese had written, that the, it's the sacred stories that you try to put together. And if you want to make a chronology, I'm not so concerned about chronology, but I'm just more concerned about pulling out more of the stories that are attached to place. And here he's transcribed this place as Jabawiganing. Jabawiganing. And I believe that this is uh, now currently called Sheboygan, Michigan. And uh, the late Art McGregor used to say Sheboygan is actually Jebwagan. And Jebwagan means a, a paddle. Oh, uh, sorry, not a paddle, an, an oar. Anyway, uh, so he situates this story at an actual place. That's the, the point of this story. And that also back to Jim Dumont's point that these events occur simultaneously and that they impinge upon our lives here in this physical realm that we know instead of the spirit realm. Where when the young lady went under the water and met those old people and who the, her potential suitor, who was a Nam Bingyat, the Bashish, Bemset, they called it that one. Anyway, uh, so here it's the spirit that came to take that young lady, kidnapped that young lady, and brought her, then eventually they brought her back up. Uh, and the reason that they mentioned here the thunders after, of course, some of you may know, but I don't know who, who maybe some of you don't. For Anishinaabe people, we believe the thunder is a giant bird and he shoots lightning from his eyes. And uh, when he cries out, that's his, uh, that's the thunder sound. And others say it's when he flaps his wings, that's the thunder sound. But their eternal enemy are those that live under the water and live under the earth. There's these giant snakes that live under the earth and these giant uh, other beings that live under the earth. So whenever these two are, are come into contact, they, they fight each other. And just like how a hawk or an eagle will eat a snake now, that's the same kind of idea. So here, that's why in this story, the, that the, uh, the old man, the parents of that young man who took the lady, they were scared that the thunder were gonna come. And sure enough, it's the thunders that come, but they already returned that girl. And again, this, is situate, this spiritual encounter was situated in an actual place that has a current name now. So the other, Last point is here, Jabuigening, Sheboygan, Michigan. Here, this is the same story of the, the young girl who was taken. The, this is the, the ending of the story. The narrator says, Me dash, me we Jabuigening, gin jejweb, jweb da ban, chejajago, manjguna wepi. And this is what supposedly happened a very long time ago at the place we know as Jabuigening. I do not know when this took place. Inishnabek ode gid naki wat, gibid naki wat yan kach. The Inishnabe have always lived in this area and they have continued to live in this area for many generations since that, ha since that happened. And this happened many generations ago. Mi manda ga ejweb zijik. Gawin dashwa weya gona nung go ode Inishnabe. Gim kama wak we. Inishnabe we debendana ba we. Today, there are no longer any Anishinaabe people living in that area as the land was stolen from them. The Anishinaabe owned that land, but it was stolen from them and their ho homes were torched. And 
and their homes were torched, burned down to get them to move away from there. Only the white people live there now. That is the end of my story. So that's the, the story told there uh, how that is situated at a specific place, but also one that is affected by colonization. The Sheboygan, now that we call Sheboygan in uh, Sheboygan, Michigan, uh, probably some people, Nishnawe people lived there, but what he's talking about is that the Nishnawe people had always lived there for many generations, but then they were dispossessed, forcibly dispossessed. So now when we are living in places like Sudbury, Toronto, London, Ontario, Peterborough, all these places, we got to find the, the Nishnabe names of those places. This old man I used to go and visit, Johnny Debaskeba. This man named Johnny Debaske, I used to go and visit, and uh, he let me record him. Here's what he said, and this is also what, what has, has struck me, and it always stuck with me, this, what he had said. A pene, a pene gwek naka dan we noswin, maba jaganash. The white man, or the non native, I should say, I guess, always changes the name. A pene gwek naka dan maba jaganash. The jaganash always tries to change the name. And when he changes the name, then he, he actually tries to cover up history. So only when we take back these names of these places and uh, discover them and tell the stories, then that's what informs our history. So the challenge for us now in indigenous history all over the world, but also particularly in our case in the Anishinaabe history is to learn these place names, the toponyms they call, and then to learn the stories that go with them, why they are called that, and then also then to find out what happened there. Sometimes these places will then have a song that goes with it. But then if we learn all this and then reconstitute that uh, these stories and fit them in within the bigger narrative, then that's when I feel we will really accomplish or fill out more of a what we call a Nishnabe history. Nishnabe uh, kenda based on Nishnabe kendas with Nishnabe knowledge. Meanwhile, that's uh, Nishnabe kinomatwina. Nishnabe teaching, Nishnabe uh, learnings. Anyway, um, that's uh, as much as I wanted to, to talk about, but uh, I'll see if there's any questions because we got 15 minutes for questions. So I see somebody actually asked about birch bark and oak tree clan. In the archival record, yes, there is a birch bark uh, clan and they were situated, the, the records that I have seen, they were situated on the uh, uh, Georgian Bay area and also Oak Tree Clan, Metigamish, and uh, those were also, there was a fella out by Rama with that clan, also out by uh, 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 New Credit, Credit River, Mississaugas, and then also out by what is now uh, Alderville area and Hiawatha area. There were, were oak tree clans. And then they don't really call it this, but the Odawa had a fork stick clan, Nesawakwaton. And that also was, uh, there's some debate as to whether that actually means a fork stick or fork in the river. So, but uh, one of the things that I had learned before was that the, the, the Bemasage or Wakagija clan of Wikwankong, that's their clan, is that fork stick. Uh, and they, they would say Metik and Naswakwat. I have um, uh, a question, um, Alan. We're just, yeah, we're still monitoring for questions. Most people, it's like lots of, uh, lo lots of miigwech for the stories and the language. So really, um, appreciate that. Um, but I wanted to, like, for you, what is the, like, what's the greatest challenge in being able to reconstitute Anishinaabek history? So if there's like upper comer 
students, should they kind of focus on language? Should they focus on really trying to understand that ontology that Jim Dumont talked about? Should they, like, like what do you, like what advice would you give? Or what have you found in the work? Cause you've been doing it for decades, I would say. Like maybe you weren't calling it Anishinaabek history 20 years ago, but it sort of kind of emerged that way after. Like, what would you, what, what do you think's been the greatest, greatest challenge or what can, this is like three questions. What can institutions or what kind of materials need to be made available for, for kids to start learning like even their own history and trying to reconstitute a history? Well, like, as you know, personally, uh, for those that don't know, Deb and I know each other. We've known each other for, I don't know, 20 odd years. Um, I've been uh, trying to learn to speak uh, Ojibwe for many of those years. Uh, and I'm not fully fluent yet. I don't, some people think I am, but I'm not. I, I, but I know more than the average uh, beginner. And I record elders and I transcribe what they say. I'll write down what they, they say in Ojibwe. And part of that is what I, like what I started out in the beginning is that principally I find that we are still relying, the, the written record is the privileged record in our education system. And then the, that privileged record actually, especially in history, we still privilege priests, fur traders, and Indian agents, what they wrote down about what had happened. And so we, we, what we have to do is we got to record our elders, record those stories, and then use them this is, of course, a historical method is what you call uh, triangulation, putting all these disparate sources together and coming up with a fuller story to find out different perspectives of what have actually happened instead of this monolithic, this is what had happened in, in Canadian history. So what I always encourage people, since I've been trying to learn the language, I always encourage people to try and learn their language because our language actually, uh, you could actually use it as a source of history as well. And that's why I talked at the beginning about the etymology of the Bajama, the Bajamoan, that uh, what Basil Johnson had, uh, had uh, talked about, that it's a, a measured account. Our language is like Latin in that it's uh, agglutinative, that it's made up of morphemes and you put initial morphemes at the beginning of the word, final morphemes at the end of the word and medials. And whenever you uh, manipulate those, you're able to get a lot of different words. So sometimes people, the elders, when they talk to me, they, they'll say, me, we, get the, get the, ajumat. that, that's it. He's telling a, an old story. Get the means this old and ajma is part of that, just narration. And then uh, others will say, ah, pane wa nishnave jish zam ajma that Nishnabe always exaggerates or goes too far. Uh, he's full of it kind of thing. And then others uh, that there are some, sometimes people are real humble, they say, ah, Jajago, Jaga Jim, Jaga Jim Jajago. I've already exhausted all that I can tell. So that's the, the, the kind of thing is you end up looking at, if you're, if you're starting out and you want to learn you actually can learn a lot about our history through our language. And then also you learn our, our worldview about it as well. And then when you put those two together, that's when you will get a more informed uh, analysis and interpretation of events. Especially in that last story that I was talking about where the, the young lady is taken by an underwater spirit. And then there those underwater spirits are talking and they talk about uh, actually uh, being afraid of being pursued by the thunders. So it's this whole other thing that's going on. Uh, one time I, I was at a, at a uh, helping out, I was helping this old man and it was for a four day period. Anyway, it was uh, we were at a sunrise, doing the sunrise and uh, that old man sitting there and not many people are around yet. And so I, I go up to him and uh, I, I ask, uh, is there anything else? And then he says, 
ko wa ma na wa an ko wa an ko o de. Do you see that cloud over there? And I looked over and I says, oh yeah, I see it. I see that cloud. And he says, uh, that cloud's been there three days. There must be something over there. So I, I never, of course, I never noticed that those three days prior that that same cloud was over there. But that old man, that's what he what he had noticed. And so if you're if you really want to engage uh, in this whole cultural revitalization, I think uh, the language is a critical component of that. And then once you start with that language part, then you can branch off to a lot of different things. And I, I know you had Joseph Pedonikwit on here uh, uh, the other week. And uh, I, I like the, all the work that he's doing. And you, uh, you just look at the, the stories uh, that the plants have. And uh, that's another book that people or a speaker is that Wendy Genius, I always say genius, but Wendy Genius Macons, uh, uh, those two books she put out, one with her mother and, uh, and uh, talking about the stories of the plants. But what I, I think what we, what we have to do is look at the plants, the names of the trees and the different names of the medicines, and then we can come up with our own taxonomy. And I shouldn't say come up with our own taxonomy. Our own taxonomy and topology is already there. Is that we haven't actually put it all together and analyzed it to actually reveal it to ourselves now. And that's the kind of stuff that we would do. So we could become, if you had the language, you could become a historian, but you could also become a botanist. And then also look at all these place names, you could become a geographer. So there's a lot of different works, but to me, the underlying underpinning of all of these is actually the Anishinaab M1, the language that we could, we could teach geography in Anishinaab M1, we could teach botany in Anishinaab M1, we could teach biology in Anishinaab M1 and we could teach social studies and history in Nishnab M1. To me, I, maybe this is just my limitation, uh, math, chemistry, and uh, physics, uh, those are harder to teach just because I don't know words for exponent, sine, cosine, tangent, uh, perpendicular angle, isomorphic uh, triangle, that, that kind of stuff. But that doesn't mean it can't be done, it's just that uh, I, 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 I want to have people pick the lowest hanging fruit, so to speak, and bolster and strengthen our base and then move on to those. Okay, I see some questions here. Uh, suggestion for a toponym and a story that will be a good educational tool, teaching university students about environmental interactions by Mazuin and the GTA. Yeah, we're, we're trying to work on that. I'm uh, currently working, we're awaiting uh, a, a grant with uh, Jennifer Benell, Dr. Jennifer Benell, a, uh, a colleague of mine in the history department, as well as uh, uh, Victoria Freeman, who is also a colleague of mine, a former uh, professor at University of Toronto, as well as York University, who has been engaged in a lot of uh, work in the GTA area as well and then also Martha Stegman. So there's a couple of things going on that people want to want to uh, work on. Oh, there's a, an, a question from Josh about the different names and meanings for our water spirits. Uh, I actually, I guess uh, myself, I don't say those names in Ojibwe in the summer. And some of you will have heard the, the, the precept or the admonition or uh, the proscription against actually telling our stories in the summer. And it is that uh, basically they're awake. And then if we say their name, we're summoning them. So to me, I'm all right with saying their name in English, but because uh, uh, I believe they don't know English. <laughs> but if you actually say their name in Ojibwe, it's just like if you were walking down the street and uh, you saw a group of people and you heard your name, you would turn and look to see who called your name. And then if they all started laughing, then you would wonder, wonder what they're laughing at. And then you would think they're laughing at me. And you would think that they're disparaging you or mocking you. And so that's why the, the elders that I uh, talked to 
they don't tell these stories in the in the spring and don't say their names in the spring and summer when when there's no snow don't talk about them uh and and i take it to mean in our language uh at that time uh i of course some say the spirit understand everything but i know some of our uh our elders say that the spirit understands only in nishnabemwin Uh, I think that's what you're referring to the, um, they just wanted to know, I think if it was uh, the late Peter Ochi's story with the three clouds, I think is uh, where some of those questions, <laughs> is that a Peter story? Yeah. Not, not all those are, um, uh, I tried to say which ones I ca came from who, and uh, Josh go and get Ken Ma or a Q and then there. So that's uh, I'll, I'll uh, leave it at that. Uh, I he used to say, and I I always uh, I try not to use his English name. Um, and I think if you use his Nishnabe name, then the people that knew him that way will know what I'm talking about. But when I use his English name. He used to always admire, uh, say to us, "Don't go around saying that that's your that he's your teacher, because you're you're trying to show off." So I always I I actually uh, in a public forum like this I never say that. Try I try to never say that uh, that this is who I got this from, just because he he. He didn't say that just once. He he would say that so many times, because a lot of people would go around saying that, "Oh, that's my teacher. That's my teacher." And he says, he would tell us, "I don't even know that person." And so that's why I don't I don't go around saying that that's who, who who's doing that. Who who told me that? But these other ones like Johnny Debaskeba or uh, Zenba Yamita Louis Debaskeba or Gijigo Benes. Uh, the late Ronnie Walker Gijic, uh, these guys, uh, they never had any proscription about, about saying that. Eh? So anyway. I think that's, I think that's really important that people have to realize when they're doing this kind of work to really respect, um, yeah, really respect who they're, who they're working with and how they want to, how they want to be acknowledged as, uh, um, as a source of knowledge. I've heard that with other, uh, elders or grandmothers and grandfathers who just said, I don't even know who that is. And yet they talk about me like they know me. So it's, yeah, it's just really showing, showing respect to people who've, um, uh, who've shared. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's 3.15 now. Most, most comments are like, everyone's just so grateful that you spent time with us and, uh, and shared language and stories. And they were, they were great. I have a whole bunch of notes. I'm not even gonna try to bother summarizing things. I'll just say, go watch the YouTube video again. And uh, like really thinking around knowledge and source of, source of knowledge and where it comes from and people being taken by spirit. I that's not really talked about in my field on indigenous knowledge systems. So this has been really um, super insightful. Um, before we close up, I just wanted to know, was there any last like 60 seconds of anything that you wanted to add or say or leave people with? Well, up to go or me go and dumb can I give it a yak mampi was mo was mo sabing he gives in do yak can a can a hench yak so I just want to thank each and every one of you for uh, logging in on the the internet and uh, taking the time to listen listen today for for what I what I'm trying to work through it gives me gives me Actually, presenting this stuff, you have to try and get it straight, and it helps you helps myself to actually uh, formulate how I'm going to uh, write about this or put it into my practice as well. So I'm grateful for the opportunity as well, and I'm glad actually people showed up uh, <laughs> or logged in, whatever. Yeah, and maybe Love. maybe yeah. one thing you can do, whoever puts this up on YouTube, uh, put the titles of those books that I that I referred to. And uh, hopefully uh, drum up some some sales as well, and uh, that would uh, that might help as well. These organi cultural organizations. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, 
Yeah, I really appreciate it, Alan. Like here you are, oh, I don't know, maybe six hours or seven or eight left in uh, Indigenous History Month, <laughs> giving us a glimpse into Anishinaabek history and the work that you want to do so we can um, we can look forward to more. So um, yeah, and really making it a point to learn language. And as you know, I was trying to, we were in the course at Vicky Maneg until, um, until COVID hit and then we couldn't meet anymore. But I'm like, I think I understood some of what you were saying. So I'm really quite pleased with myself. And <laughs> thank you for... Uh, uh, speaking it and using it. Um, so, so, so I want to thank everybody um, again for for joining in, and also um, any of the activities that you've been part of with the Indigenous Environmental Justice Project, and we're planning what we want to do for the rest of the summer. So stay tuned, and um, as well as thanking uh, Chimiguetch to Alan for because I know we had to really think about this. We had conversations, and so I know a lot of like thought went into this, and um, and Chimiguetch for that. It's just again thanking the the students for all for making it happen. Um, anybody who knows me and IT knows I have to be managed. Um, so that's Dali, JC, Jesse, William, Ethan, Amelia, David, and and others for um, for putting this all together uh, and making it happen. Um, really appreciate the work that you've done. And and with that, Alan, just be question. Good to see you. One more thing. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so I just said that before I, just to, to tell you that just be, before I talked, I, I ended up uh, offering that uh, Sama, just in case people want, were wondering about it. Yeah, it's hard to do that, uh, pull that off um, virtually yeah, sometimes. Yeah. yeah, so we have to... Um, well, it worked. You got uh, <laughs> it really centered, uh, centered you in a good way. So, so again, uh, chimigosh to everyone. Chimigosh, and really good to see you. Actually, yeah. yeah. Okay. Bye, everybody.